Uh, first, before we get into all, any of this stuff, uh, I, I mentioned this a few times on the podcast. I've tweeted out, I, I, I fucking love Rivals. I love it. I listened to it. I listened to it this morning when I was running. I listened to it every Wednesday. It's, my, it's actually probably my favorite. I like it more than my podcast. It's my favorite podcast right now. Oh, my God. That's so nice of you to say. Thank you. I, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I, I wonder, like, did you ever in your mind, so I've, I've talked to it, so people listening know what I'm talking about. You must have had, when you did a list of them all, like, obviously, like Van Halen themselves, Van Halen versus Michael Anthony versus Halen, Van Halen versus Roth, of course, or Hagar. They're their own, like, you did three parts on CSNY. You could do 20 on Van Halen. Yeah, you know, we were actually talking about doing Van Halen at some point, you know, before Eddie passed yesterday. So, yeah, we'll definitely do, like you said, I think we could do a couple. There's obviously the David B. Roth era, there are issues with him, and then Hagar is a, is a whole other issue. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, for as fun of a band as that is, there really was like a lot of behind the scenes drama, <laughs> weirdly, with, with Van Halen. But, uh, you know, it seems like that's true of every band, which is why that podcast. I think we'll be able to do it for a long time. There's no shortage of right. you know these types of conflicts out there. So I grew up. So uh, how old are you? I'm 43. Okay, so you're I'm 45. You're about so you know you're a couple years younger than me. So for me, like as a kid, as a sort of a nine, ten year old listening to top 40 music, like that was all I knew. Like I thought in '84, I was like, oh, here's Van Halen. They're just like Culture Club or you know whoever. They're like this. <laughs> they're, you know, I'm like I didn't know about the past. So for me, it started with 1984 jump and I'll wait in Panama. And then you go backwards. But what I like, what I kind of like about Van Halen is like you said, like there's no, like their music was just always kind of fun. Like there was no, now there was a lot of darkness going on, but like, I don't know anybody. I was saying this to start of the show today. I don't know anybody. There are people who hate, you know, Dylan, there are people who hate the stones, the Beatles. I don't know anybody who hates Van Halen. No. And you know, to your point, I mean, you're totally right that in like the mid eighties, like around the time of that 1984 record, like Van Halen, they, they were a pop band. I mean, they were also, you know, a hard rock, heavy metal fan and, you know, hard rock, heavy metal fans love them, but yeah, you didn't have to be a metal fan to be into Van Halen. And I think that's really like what makes them unique in, in the history of, of, of that kind of music. They really are. I think the first metal band that's like purely, was there like you a, know, was like, there, was was there, was, was, I'm sorry, was there, was there at the time, was there like a, almost like, so like I'm just for some backs, like I'm a massive Springsteen fan, huge, huge, huge Springsteen fan. So like when Born in the USA came out, I know like guys like my uncle who were older, there was sort of this sellout attachment to Born in the USA, the album, it was so commercial. Did hardcore Van Halen fans feel that way about 1984 or no? I think so. Although, you know, again, we're around the same age, so that was the first record I heard right, too. Right, right. And I remember, some of my earliest memories of MTV are seeing oh, like sure. jump yeah. and hard for, and hot for teacher. Yeah. And like, I was like way too young to be seeing hot for teacher. <laughs> right, you know? right, I was like right, six, right. seven years old. But, uh, you know, but yeah, I love those songs. You know, I, I and to me, like, yeah, I, I was listening to Michael Jackson and Madonna and Springsteen, all the big pop stars at that time that you saw on MTV. And like you said, like Van Halen, they just seemed like they were another uh, flavor of that. I mean, they really were just this enormous, band um you know that's the thing about you know it, it's weird right now because obviously if you love van halen it's really sad yeah uh that right now that eddie van halen died but then when you start listening to van halen music or you watch their videos you can't really stay sad for very long like i i've never been depressed listening to van halen it always will like lift my spirit no that's you know, it listening yeah. to that band that's it, because like, you know, for me, I said the start of the show, so in like 84, 85, I could have taken a left or a right. I could have loved Van Halen for the rest of the way, or like Bruce, and because I'm a person who, you know, had issues with my dad and deal with depression and stuff, I went with Bruce. Like, there's no, you know, there's no My Father's House with Van Halen. There's no straight time with Van Halen, you know? It's just, you know, it's dancing right. either way, and I'll wait, and hut for teacher, and, and that's okay, too, you know? But like, it's weird. Eddie Van Halen's clearly a guy, clearly a guy, right? who was a genius, had some real dark stuff, but it didn't really translate, unless I'm missing it, it didn't really translate musically. Like it was, I don't know if that's making sense or not. No, I think you're right. I mean, I was thinking about this before uh, you called and just, you know, thinking of the song like Running With The Devil right. from the first Van Halen record. And, 
you know, like if Black Sabbath had a song called Running with the Devil, it would be a song about evil and like right, the darkness right, right. of life. And, and, but when Van Halen does it, it's just about like, let's raise hell. Let's have a good time. Um, and that was the vibe of that band. And you're right. I mean, I, I mean, obviously I love Springsteen too. And it, to me, it's just like two different flavors. It's like, if I want something a little more, I guess, substantial, or that's going to address like the heavy parts of my life, I'm going to listen to Bruce. But if it's like, Friday night and I'm having a beer or something like Dan Halen really hits the spot, you know? So kind of just depends on, I guess what, what, what mood you're in at that particular moment. It feels to me like, uh, th- like Hagar was fine and everything, but in a weird way, I felt like Van Halen sort of stopped when, when Roth left the band. I know that they did a bunch of stuff, but it just, I, I don't know. It's a, uh, you know, I know it's the old debate. There's a clear line, but it's almost like in my mind, Eddie Van Halen's kind of, slipped away in the last 20 years. I know he's had a lot of health issues, but I just feel like he kind of, he was very, you know, wasn't, unless I'm missing stuff, wasn't particularly prolific in the last 10 or 15 years. No, I mean, Van Halen, I think they put out um, a comeback record with Roth. With Roth, like yeah. Seven. Yeah. Like different kind of truth. I think that was like late aught. And other than that, they didn't put out any other records. I mean, I think, I mean, the thing with the Hagar years is that they were, like, really successful yeah. during that time and, you know, sold millions of records and had hits. But I agree with you, and I think most people agree with that at this point, that if you're talking about Van Halen, it, it is about those first six records. And in a way, maybe with Van Halen, it, it, it's like it was hard for him to mature because those records, the great records that he made, to me, just embody, like, what it's like to be in your teens and twenties, you know, there's something that's just so carefree about that music. And I think with Hagar, they tried to, you know, they had songs like right now, yeah. you know, that were more philosophical in a way. And, and that's kind of cool, but it's like, do you really want that from Van Halen or do you want hot for teacher? You know, it's right. just, I think it's just harder for some, like, again, going back to Bruce, you know, it was in a way easier for him to mature because like, yeah, you want him to talk about what it's like to be in his 40s or his 50s. And you're, going, you're turning to him for something maybe a little deeper with some more wisdom to it. Whereas with Van Halen, it's like, I just want to have fun. And it's like, if they're getting philosophical, like, I don't know if I really want this. Well, plus, <laughs> yeah, plus, and, you know, plus Bruce was a lyricist, right? Like, I, you know, I, I don't think Eddie, right. I, don't think, I, I don't know this, but my guess is Eddie, you know, did the music and I, I guess Roth did some. I, I don't even know. No, yeah, he didn't write lyrics, but I, I think like when you listen to those later period Van Halen records, I think there was an attempt to also be more mature musically, where they yeah. weren't like I think like the music that he was writing started started to get a little moodier. You no, know, again, like that song right now, for instance, is like right piano based song. It, it seems like it's a little more sort of self consciously serious in a way that the early Van Halen records aren't. You know, those records, I think which is what I love about them. It's they're not pretentious at all. Well, I, it, know, just it, like, that's a perfect word because like when I think of, you know, whether you like them or not, like, you know, Zeppelin, the doors, the stones, sometimes certainly, you know, like McCartney and Lennon, like all of a sudden Van Halen rolled in. I think you tweeted out the picture of uh, him from the Panama video yesterday. They were so unpretentious in the early eighties in those videos. And they were hot for teacher in Panama. And they exploded when MTV exploded, if you said to me MTV, like Van Halen's one of the first or second groups I think of, and they were actually like making fun of themselves and having a good time where nobody else did that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I said this yesterday, that's, that's something that really stands out to me about Eddie Van Halen because I, mean, I think everyone recognizes how great of a musician he was and how he revolutionized guitar and he was a real virtuoso. But unlike a lot of, you know, virtuoso level musicians, he didn't take himself seriously in terms of his public image. I mean, I think he took his music seriously, right. but you know, it wasn't like he was playing music that was like self-consciously difficult or clinical or cold. He wrote really good pop songs, you know, and was able to show off his technique in the context of that, um, which I th- I find really endearing. You know, I love the fact that he could kind of be both of those things, this consummate musician, but also kind of a goofball. Um, it, it seems like that's like one of the things I think people really love about him and, and that band in general. 
Yeah, and I mean, uh, and the other huge thing, like just from a cultural perspective, is beat it. Like it's hard to as a kid in the eighties. Oh, yeah. the, the idea that they came. I'm like Eddie Van Halen's playing on. I don't. And the story is he did it in one take, and he didn't take any money for it, and he changed a bunch of stuff. And Quincy Jones is like, yeah, I don't know. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah, that, that's insane to me. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think most people know that he played the solo, and if you listen to it, it's like unmistakably Eddie Van right, Halen. Definitely, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's definitely him, but also the fact that he rearranged the song and like did it behind Michael Jackson's back apparently, and then Michael Jackson heard it and thought, "Oh, this you actually made it better." Like I'm, I'm not upset about it. I mean, it's insane that he didn't get any money for that. Like you would think that he, that Michael would have maybe kicked him a couple of points off of that yeah, song. Yeah, massive hit. Like, that's the I mean, that you know, obviously Eddie was doing all right financially, but I mean, that would have been a huge windfall uh, for him if, if he could have gotten paid for that. But, um, and also, I mean, like from things that I've read about, um, Eddie Van Halen, it just, I'm not even sure like to what degree, like he even knew who Michael Jackson was like right. when right. he did that. Right. Right. Like, like it sounds like he wasn't all that, um, hip to, to music. Like I, I don't think he like bought a lot of records. He said that like the last guitar player that he really studied was Eric Clapton. And then he didn't really pay attention to guitar players after that. Um, so I don't know. There's something about him where it seemed like he was kind of in a bubble <laughs> in a way. And um, maybe that's another reason why, like you were saying, he didn't do as much in the last 20 years. In some ways, maybe he kind of closed himself off a little too much. Possibly. I don't know. Well, it seemed like a lot of, you know, between the Roth stuff, the Hagar stuff, getting rid of Michael Anthony, bringing his son in, it just seemed like there was a sort of endless tinkering too, though. Like his son, his son was, yeah, like, his son was yeah. like, his son was like 15 when he joined the band or something. Yeah. It, you know, it's a, I don't know. As someone who loves the original Van Halen, I always thought it was a little sad yeah. when they did the Michael Anthony, totally. you know, and I understand wanting to put your son in the band and, you know, his son's a great musician too. Um, but, Michael Anthony just seems like the nicest guy in that band. And he was, um, you know, his, his harmony vocals are such a huge part of their sound. And, uh, you know, it's just too bad that that wasn't a full fledged Van Halen reunion because Michael Anthony wasn't involved. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just sort of like another weird thing in the background of, of that band. It just seemed like there was always some level of drama going on, especially after Roth left in the mid eighties. seems like the early years were fairly smooth. And then the next, you know, 35 years were, were kind of crazy. Are they the best example of a band that's defined by somebody who's not their lead singer? Yeah. I, I mean, well, there's Santana, I guess would be another example. Um, you know, you know Carlos Santana does right. the thing. Yeah, Jay Giles, I, I mean, guess, but yeah. 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 I mean, but yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting with, with Van Halen because you know, the original version of that band, I mean, David Lee Roth is a huge part of that band. Oh, massive. Yeah. And I mean, is, is, I mean as, a kid, as a kid for me in the 80s, like, I remember when, when they broke, when, remember when David Lee Roth, I'm sure you remember David Lee Roth came back to, like that one time when they gave away an award at the MTV Awards in like the mid 90s. Remember, and it like, was a total disaster and they broke up. Remember, there was rumors they were going to come back together. And they interviewed Eddie, right. Van, and they interviewed Eddie Van Halen for it. And he was like ripping Roth. I remember watching it. And I was like, I don't think I've ever seen Eddie Van Halen like speak except for once or twice. For me, it was all Roth as a kid. Roth was like this just consuming, just like river of sound that just swallowed the band, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, clearly I think Eddie and his brother, Alex, you know, they came to really be annoyed by David Lee Roth, right. which on some level is understandable. I mean, yeah, I, I get why that would be the case. Yeah. But really, it's too bad. I mean, because the way it's, I was listening to, you know, a bunch of Van Halen getting ready to talk to you, and Eddie Van Halen, his guitar playing, he could really play off of David Lee Roth's vocals mm -hmm. like in a really cool way. Like, yeah. they're really, you know, it's weird to describe guitar playing as witty. But there would be like little, like David Lee Roth would say something. It was almost like a call and response thing sometimes where David Lee Roth would sing something and, and Eddie Van Halen would do like kind of like a funny little sound on his guitar, uh, almost like a rim shot, but playing it on his guitar. And it's, it's just part of the magic of that early band, you know, that 
that make it so infectious because you feel like these guys, even if they weren't maybe friends behind the scenes, they just seem like a bunch of buddies who are, you know, drinking and having a good time and they're playing in a rock band. Um, and it's just so infectious. And you don't really get that with Sammy Hagar. I mean, Hagar was just more of a serious guy, relatively, more of a conventional rock singer. You know, like, for Ross, he isn't really a singer. You know, He's just, like a hype man. It just felt, cor- you know, it felt like with, with Hagar, it just felt like corporatized almost. Like, here's here's a couple, right. of, here's some, like, you know, like you said, right now, or what's this, why can't this be love? Like, they were fine, but I was like, this could be Sammy Hagar with, like, a good backup band. Like, it didn't feel, it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't feel as loose. Right, and it's more of like a, just more of like a, like, I mean, obviously, Hagar can sing circles around Ross on a technical level. Right. Like, he's a better singer, but, like, he's not the right singer for Van Halen. You know, like it was, like you said, it kind of just made him sound more generic when he was a singer. Whereas with Ross, I think combination of his antics and again, he didn't really sing. He kind of had this like, almost like talk rap singing thing going on playing off of uh, Van Halen's guitar. It's just a totally unique thing. And you take him out and even as great as Eddie Van Halen's guitar playing is, they're just not as unique of a rock band. They're just sort of like a lot of other 80s rock bands at that point. So I'm not, I'm not a massive, I'm a casual at best Radiohead fan, but I, I can read this book if that's not the case, right? I think so. I, I, you know, the thing about the book is that obviously it's talking a lot about Radiohead, but I was also really interested in just talking about the era, like mm-hmm. the end, like the turn of the century, Yep. Um, which it was a very fascinating time. And, you know, there's a lot of other things in there about just like music at the time, music culture and like rock music, how that changed. And, uh, there's, there's, there's like things in there about the strokes and like Lincoln park and like movies that were coming out at the time and, um, kind of putting Radiohead in the context of that. And, you know, if you're not a huge Radiohead fan, maybe this book will at least give you a little bit more of an appreciation for it. And there's also a lot of jokes in it. It's, it's, I think it's funnier than like Radiohead usually is. Right. At least that's what I'm told. So okay. if you think that Radiohead's sort of a self-serious fan, um, you'll you'll probably laugh reading my book more than you would listening to Radiohead. Okay. And as a huge Springsteen fan, there, there's going to be no Springsteen Rivals episode because he he's kind of ha- like who's a, who? There's nobody. Who's going to? No, exactly. I was thinking about that. Boring. It's almost boring. No. Yeah, I mean Springsteen versus Mike Appel. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm feeling it. I don't know. That would be it. Yeah, that was, that might be. But even they became yeah, the they, buddies they at the end. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah, the thing with Bruce is that you know he is on one level universally beloved. I think you know, especially now, he's like this national monument. Yeah, really. Yeah, I mean, everyone loves Springsteen. Yeah, right. But on the other level, like, he's he's a loner too. Like he like for a lot of his career. You know, even like with the East Street Band, you know, I, I I don't really feel like he hung out with those guys. I guess other than like Stephen Van, oh, Van Zandt, like yeah, they were right. buddies, right? But um, but like from a creative standpoint, and he writes a lot about this in his book, you know, that he was like a lone wolf, you know, for like a long time in his career, like where he would just go off on long drives and yeah, he'd go you know, yeah, he'd go up in the mountains, and, and, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. motorcycles, and it's weird. He's seventy one. He's made. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars has, and I, you can tell like he's still searching. Like he's still not in so, some. I know he's happy in some ways, but you can tell just listening to his music, he's not. He's not there yet. No, did you get a chance to see Springsteen on Broadway? I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Unbelievable. I, uh, yeah, it was. It was so crazy seeing that show. Like, first of all, I got hooked up big time for that. Uh, a publicist got me in fourth row center seat. Nice. So I was like, I'm like, this is as close as I'll ever get to through probably in my life. And I remember early in the show, he starts playing my hometown on the piano. Yeah, yeah. And I just instantly got choked up because the, I mean, the performance was beautiful, but like, I think just the sound of his unamplified voice, like where mm-hmm. I don't think he had a microphone. I think he was just singing. And it's like, I was just so, you know, every other time I've seen Bruce, he's been in an arena with the East Street Band. He's like howling over a band. Right. And now it was like, 
Bruce is right in front of me singing unamplified. I'm getting chills just thinking about it right yeah, now. Uh, it was same with me from my yeah. voice was so emotional. Same with me from my it's father's house. At, my father's house at that. I mean, it's the same. Yeah, that's why I like the Devils and Dust tour and the Joe tour. Getting to go those so much. It's 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 intimate. But I, I I'm going to give you. Because uh, I love the documentary so much, you you got to do for me. I'm I'm, I'm giving a, a, as a rivals. I promoted rivals a lot. You got to give me an Eagles episode, please, because that is a great. Oh, I mean, that is just that could almost be a season. That could almost be its own podcast. Oh, believe me, <laughs> believe me. Yeah, I mean, I I love that movie too, and yeah, that would be another multiple one. I mean, there's so many that like oh, it never ends. We're just we're, we're just favoring. I think that like you know that we haven't done yet that we're just saving. For at some point, but uh, yeah, like that, and like you know, I'm really excited at some point to talk about Jagger and Richard. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that's multiple right episodes. Um, yeah, but yeah, the Eagles are. I, yeah, that whole movie. It's great. It's, it's, it's incredible. I've, I've watched it forty five thousand times. I know every line in the movie. <laughs> I'm serious. My 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 brother and I will text each other lines from it almost every day. I, I was obsessed with it for like a year. I just I love. How angry everybody is! They're, they're so corporate. They're so joyless. It, I take I take such oh, pleasure yeah. in it. It's it's wonderful. It's, it's so bizarre. Uh, but can you like can you swear on this podcast? Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's like that part of the game where they're like, "Shit don't float." Shit don't float. Yeah. You know? They go right into uh, life in the fast lane. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Right. Like exactly. They're in the back of the limousine drinking beer, and yeah, they're like, just, you know. We're at the top of the mountain. It gets pretty windy up here. You know, Led Zeppelin did it. Or the Led Zeppelin. The Led Zeppelin. The Led Zeppelin. Yes. Yeah. Just the way uh, Henley says that. Yeah. Fantastic. It's, uh, God, it's yeah. so good. Yeah. It's like only Joe Walsh comes off well, really. Yeah. I got uh, Timothy Beach there. Yeah. I feel kind of bad for Felder, but, you know, I'm sure it's it's a complicated story, but I don't know. But oh, I, yeah. He's like crying at yeah, the he's end. He's like weeping at he's the like end. He's breaking down. It's great. But yeah, the podcast is great. I'm going to read the book. It, uh, this isn't happening. Radiohead's Kid A in the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, and hopefully, you know, anytime you want to come on, we'll, uh, you're promoting anything or we can get you back on to talk about uh, music. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, we'll, we'll just recite the whole Eagles documentary next time. I think that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, that first year was a little lost, but somewhere along the way, Joe found himself when he's talking about that corporate reunion. Like, you know, it's just... <laughs> Glenn Fry, who, was, who came across like every bullying, you know, I could, when you watch that documentary, I'm like, I could see why Cameron Crowe cast him in that role in Jerry Maguire. It's the greatest oh, casting yeah. of all time, in, in a way. He's like, 90% of the time, being in the Eagles was, was a, a fucking blast. blast. There you go. <laughs> exactly. All right, Steven. He's like not smiling. Just no, no, yeah, there's like, no joy to it. None. None. <laughs> uh, well, all right, well, thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you. Thanks, dude. All right, Appreciate see, it. See you, man. Thanks. 